Uh, Carrot, stay out of this for a second. I'm going to stay completely out of it. I swear okay. to God, I'm just going to look. I'm just going to look pretty. Stay out of it. I need to talk to an expert about the sports stories going on of our time. Okay. Uh, Amin just went into his phone and saw that Inter Miami's following just went from one million to five million overnight because the biggest star in the world is coming to Miami. I think I can say dwarfs. LeBron in international shame. I saw Tyreek Hill was saying, welcome to Miami, uh, Messi, and Messi has no idea who that is. <laughs> uh, like, none. It would have no idea who Tyreek Hill is. Uh, but the biggest star in sports is coming to Miami. And Roger Bennett, you know uh, soccer better than most. So explain to us what just happened here, because I think Messi just decided that he wants to be as an athlete, as a brand, he wants to be Apple Plus, he wants to be somebody who's even bigger than he already is. It's not a bad thing to be. I don't know if in the terms of the deal, he has to play football while wearing one of those Apple Pro visors, Dan, all the time, which would be which would be pretty wicked product placement, and he'll still score a hat trick. But it is it's an amazing day for anyone who loves the growth of the sport, football in the nation that we adore, the United States of America. Lionel Messi coming to join into Miami to come and hang out with you. And he's getting he's getting kind of meadow lot money to do it. The greatest player of his generation. This is like the seven time MVP, the Blondor winner, fresh off that kind of Greek mythic quest World Cup win with Argentina. And he transcends football, this tiny little bloke. He's only five foot seven. But I do believe the noise he makes is kind of visible from out of space. And he's coming to Miami, which is going to create scenes like the the end of Scarface I think across your city it's really it's just a it's hard to describe how it's as if the the Dalai Lama was really good at football and was coming to live and breathe amongst us it's going to be quite a zoo it's going to feel like oh Basel every single weekend that he plays in your city Dan. I know it's going to be so fun, but what does it mean, Roger? Like historically, I just can't belie what believe. What does anything mean, Dan? <laughs> what does anything mean? We're all going to die. I mean, it's just about what we do between now and then. Is that really what you want to talk about? What does it mean that Lionel Messi is now Florida man? Is that what you're asking? I uh, I am asking you that when the biggest <laughs> star in sports comes and lends his name to American soccer, when he's at the height of his leverage, what has just happened is a giant gangster business this move on the messy brand is about to try and conquer the United States as well, as well. It has not yet. And if it can, then soccer can too. Yeah, this is like for your listeners, this is a bit like if LeBron decided, you know, sod the Lakers right now, I'm still pretty good. You know, I can still, you know, at the offensive end, I can still make crap happen. Shanghai Sharks, here I come. I'm going to do a ton of lucrative crap in China. Or if Tom Brady came back and goes like, uh, Ottawa Red Blacks, the CFL, we're going next level. Um, that's kind of what it feels like. And America's had its football moments on the men's side. We are back-to-back -back winners of the Women's World Cup. They are kicking ass. On the men's side, you know, we've had Pelé. We've had David Beckham. This is both of those gents times a thousand. Messi is, um, you know, in this digitally wired age, he is faintly visible from space as the world's greatest public billboard and you know, what does it mean it means it's one in the eye for saudi arabia you can have the golf but you can't have Lionel messi they are currently just throwing crazy like take oil wells uh kareem benzema you want more than an oil well you want to hold this they are trying to buy every single footballer he they offered him 1.3 billion dollars um to go and play there Lionel messi again meadow lot money for you guys build a very nice pirate ship with that but is they have three kids his wife is like, you know, funny enough, I don't fancy Saudi Arabia uh, for our kids to grow up in. He's got a place in Miami uh, already. He loves the lifestyle. He knows where to get his mate. And it is a very creative offer that they put together. It's not just the money that MLS have, have conjured. They'd offered him uh, ownership of the team into Miami when he leaves. Uh, Apple have kicked in. They've apparently given him uh, the uptick in broadcast sales with his arrival. Adidas have given him the same for their brand uh, upon his arrival, but it's going to be it's going to it's going to be messianic. He's going to be courtside. It's going to be Messi and Jimmy Butler. It's going to be Messi high fiving Tua before games, and it is for the game of football, um, which is about to rocket with the World Cup coming here in 2026. It's rocket fuel for the growth of the game. There are going to be kids 
across America who will be able to pay witness with our own eyes to Lionel Messi. And you've seen ticket prices shoot up into Miami's Instagram, you know, times five, five million, I think it is now. It was a million this time yesterday. We're going to the moon. Roger, the 94 World Cup gave us basically MLS coming off of that, the popularity of that event. As you mentioned, 2026, we're going to be co-hosting with Canada and Mexico with the arrival of Messi here for MLS. Is this the watershed moment where MLS forces itself up into the conversation with the big four? Yeah, I mean, th th this is a great question. And 1994 was meant to, you know, football here. I was here then. It was still like uh, Americans did not just not like football. They actively hated it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and football was like space to Captain Kirk, the final frontier. Everybody else was mad for football. America was like, nope. <laughs> you know, uh, we throw it, we rush with it, we kick return, that's football. And you almost protested too much. And 94 was meant to make the game overnight into America's game as if it was a pogo stick or a yo-yo, like a fad. But instead, the growth was slow and steady. It was not an overnight sensation, but it has grown with different drivers. EA Sports FIFA game mm -hmm. has since tied a whole generation to the Star Wars cantina of characters who play the bloody thing. Um, you know, the, the digital connecting us to the best leagues in the world, the Champions League, the Premier League on a weekly basis has, has allowed us to follow the, the, the narrative, this, this kind of telenovela played out live but on foreign shores, in our pajamas, with beers on a Saturday morning. Um, and so America has slowly become, there's a massive audience now. You know, Men in Blazers, we've been able to wire up that American audience. It's deep, it's passionate, it's growing, it's super young. And yes, um, I don't think it's like going to be one moment. I think 2026, the commercial brands that are coming in, the spotlight, the white hot heat of all of that. Messi is going to be a driver but it's going to be one of many. Um, and ultimately, what is the goal? It's that America becomes a normal football nation like the rest of the world where kids play. You know, everyone who comes on our show, you know, JJ Watt, did you play soccer? Yes, until mm -hmm. when? Age eight. Larry Nance Jr., till age nine. Um, eight, nine, ten, everybody plays and then they drop it. And seeing Messi, this is what I'm most excited about, seeing Messi go from city to city in the United States. Um, you know, families are little girls, boys going with their own eyes to watch this. I, I've watched him play live. I'm not a religious person. It is a spiritual experience seeing that little man do what he can do, <laughs> playing as if the ball is inside his own shoe, as, as a, a, a Uruguayan poet, Eduardo Galeano, once said. Um, to watch that and not give up at eight, not give up at nine, but make it your sport of choice. That's what I'm most excited about. But the, All of us are going to be able to pay witness. Can, can Messi make the MLS an exportable product? Meaning, will people in other countries watch our games? Oh, I mean, you're asking a good question. I'm here to say lovely things. I'm here to bring <laughs> joy and vibe and positivity. You're asking the hard-hitting, bloody questions. Um, Messi's going to be playing at an 18,000-seater temporary stadium. Into Miami are currently building a place in Miami. Right, but I'm sure the noise is keeping Dan up in his penthouse. Um, keep the noise down, for God's sake. Um, but, you know, he's in the, playing in the flight Sounds path. Like he's playing in a flight path of an international airport. He's playing with, you know, the team will change dramatically now. They're going to be importing a lot of South Americans. But there's currently, you know, there's guys that wouldn't, you know, I'd say there's guys that are far from his, what he's used to. He's used to playing on the best team in every league he's mm -hmm. played in. Inter Miami are currently bottom. But I think this transcends football. What is about to occur, every restaurant he goes to, will become iconic. Every nightclub uh, he he spends any time in will become the phenom. Wherever he walks his dog in Miami, this giant dog, Senor Hulk, will become like a heritage site. And I do, I feel almost like a holy man is about to walk amongst us. Ticket prices in New York um, <laughs> within an hour, like we're at times a thousand what they were face value. That's ultimately, it's a it's about the football, but not about the football. Like when David Beckham played it for the LA Galaxy, um, I used to watch him. Whenever he, whenever his team would score, he was smart enough, even if he did nothing to do with the goal, to just drop to his knees, point to the sky, to the heavens, 
knowing that every camera would photograph him as if he just scored the goal. <laughs> and I think that's, that's ultimately what we're going to see with Lionel Messi over the next couple of years. What we have done here is very disrespectful to Carrot Top, a comedy legend. Uh, very disrespectful. <laughs> uh, and and he's, he seems uh, deathly bored that Messi has taken over the conversation. You, you don't seem interested in... Uh, you don't want to be listening to this. He's also on mute. I don't know if I'm his... trying to unmute. <laughs> okay, there you go. Like, your, I was mute. I was. You start talking, and I mute. I was waiting for you to stop talking, and then I unmute. Your thoughts, Carrot Top, on what? On, on the messy. We have a lot in common. He and I. I mean, me. I walk down Vegas. People go to restaurants that I go to, and uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, Caesars just offered me two hundred and ten dollars to switch to their hotel. Um, <laughs> Uh, but go we ahead, don't, go we ahead don't, and no. shut his but microphone off. Just shut his mic. Off. Go ahead and mute him, uh, Roger. You're the co-host of. <laughs> they say there are no bad ideas. <laughs> you're the co-host. I think of this one was a bad idea. Chris Cody's idea. Co-host of the Men in Blazers <laughs> podcast. Co-founder of the Men in Blazers Media Network. Uh, he's auth- also the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Reborn in the USA: An Englishman's Love Letter to His Chosen Home. I want, and I know we've got to get you out of here. But the live thing, the Saudi money thing, you're always good on the bigger subjects, on the complicated subject matter. Uh, were you appalled as somebody who's not... Is exa- this for me or is that for him? <laughs> it's for you, Carrot Top. What's your take? By the way, I'll tell you, Car- Carrot-, Carrot Top's take on the Saudis here is that he was offered $210. He wants the Saudi counter to come yeah, in before he yeah. decides whether he wants to accept it yeah, or not. Yeah, if Saudi would only ask me... I mean, I mean, I'm playing at the Luxor. It's kind of... Yeah. You know. Close. Does make a little sense. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I don't know. Yeah, that's a, yeah, I think I'm gonna pass this to you. I don't I don't know anything about uh, the live thing except that and everyone got out of it and they're all pissed off about it. You and, thought I was asking? And, what? You thought I was asking you that? I was kidding. Of course, I knew you weren't asking me that. I'm standing here in this show, and I figured I'll take this one, right? Uh, Roger, good seeing you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Carrotop.com right. for tickets. Yeah. All right, Roger, take it away. <laughs> yeah. I had to make it fun. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a bit of an idiot, right? Because I've been yelling at Brock Meyer about his podcast. His podcast is due. It's supposed to have celebrity guests. He hasn't actually done it. He's generally irresponsible. But I am loath to admit that I've enjoyed him showing up here every week or so on a semi-regular basis to talk about just sports stuff. And I didn't know, I forgot that it was today that you were coming in. And so I didn't dress better. You crushed me last week. Uh, so what are we doing today with my, let's do a fit check here. Uh, because I really came in poorly dressed today. <laughs> yeah, because the other days you're such a fashion plate. Uh, <laughs> let's take a look at you today. Well, Dan, you look like you stopped by the studio on your way to teach the least popular curves class in existence. Uh, is there like a special section at Dick's Sporting Goods that sells workout gear for the man who has everything but wants to look like he's got nothing? Because uh, if there, what do you just, you just go down there and just empty entire racks into your car. All right, let's get to game three last night. You like, and by the kudos, by the way, there was less whining about the podcast this time. Soon we'll have no whining, but we're progress, <laughs> we're not perfection. We're supposed to have a podcast. We're supposed nah, to- I shouldn't have said anything. Here we go. Okay, regardless. We're supposed to have a podcast. <laughs> uh, my, my hat is enormous. <laughs> you were. He really sounds like you. I don't understand, though. Okay, never mind. He's supposed to do his job. Uh, Enjoy what you have. My goodness, Mm. Mr. Glass Half Empty and Hat Quite Full. I've never noticed that. You do got like one of those Brian Robinson fake hats. The big hats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the big hats. Comically big hats, Dan. Look who's to a pot calling Kettle Black. What's on your head? (laughs) (laughs) What the hell is on your head, sir? (laughs) My God, it's like Miami took a shit on your head. <laughs> uh, speaking of Miami, game three last night, what were your thoughts, Brock Meyer? Because we'll get to baseball, I suppose, maybe not. But you have all uh, random sports thoughts on all things topical. Yeah, we'll get to baseball for sure. I understand. Uh, your stu- Is your studio right across from the arena? Is that correct? That's yes. Right. Uh huh. Okay, so maybe you can hang a sign on the front of your building. There it is. 
remind Miami Heat fans that a basketball game is in fact 48 minutes long. Because every time their team is losing in the last few minutes of a finals game, the entire lower bowl turns tail and, and exits the building. I mean, you would have thought that after missing out on Ray Allen's shot there, they would have learned their lesson. But no, four minutes to go in this one. They all walked out like the like the. Well, it looked like the love guru started playing on the jumbotron or something. Vile. Remember the love guru? Love anyone? Love guru? Yeah. Mike Myers. For a while, we were all like, what can't Mike Myers do? <laughs> and, and, and then we found out. We found out, didn't we? The love guru. Uh, can we get back to the game, please? Yes. Uh, interesting game. He gave up 30-point triple-doubles to Jokic and Murray. Yeah, Very hard. difficult to outgrit a team when they're throwing up those numbers <laughs> against you. Yeah. But the difference in the game was Christian Brown. Mm. I mean, my God, what a performance from the Nuggets rookie there. I got it. I was very taken with his PG 13 good looks and his <laughs> muscular build and uh, haircut you can set your watch to. I am not, a, I'm not ashamed to say this. This young man gave me a sports media boner that lasted for more than three hours. I had to contact my doctor. Which, by the way, you know that that state of affairs, you know this, Dan Levitard, that's what's known as a Tebow, that level of arousal. Because you know, every once in a while, there comes a white player, a white boy with real athleticism, not scrappy, not an effort guy, a real player with a face that looks like it's just Dying to talk about Jesus Christ all the time. <laughs> yeah, he's the kind of innate winner who'll be a lot of awful, <laughs> terrible people's favorite person. You know, kind of. Uh, he can just lift an entire sports network for months. This. Do year. you have any sports analysis that isn't that Christian Brown is white? I have real Christian Brown analysis. All kidding aside, as a rookie, he might lack NBA experience, but that also means that that his recent college experience. Includes a lot more zone defense than any of his teammates out there. He, he's the only nugget who's ever broken down a zone in a championship game that last year in a tournament with Kansas. Finding soft spots, back cuts, pocket passes to slice up Miami's 2-3 and 2-2-1 zone. That comes easy to him. He's already done it at the very, very highest of levels. So he's good. That's actual analysis. That's there. Good, like, it's good analysis. It's coaching non-racialized analysis. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank now, you. Now, you're welcome, Dan. Now, if I could find one word to describe the way Christian Bound... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm hitting it. What is off. it now? That's a brown liquor. <laughs> you're, I got, I, will you be a professional? I, I got the Sazerac with the Kahlua. Because it's mix, morning time. You can't and some coffee. Mix those two things. Brock Meyer, it's irresponsible. What do you mean? Look, I, you, sure you can. I got it right here. Look at Didn't, it. Season four on Hulu, weren't you sober? Wow. I can't decide what you whine more about. My sobriety, the fact that you don't get a podcast. My goodness. We should. Uh, well, don't slow your words when we're talking. I'm sorry. I'm sure you're right. I should be professional. Christian Brown. I want to get back to him because there's one way to describe the way he plays. One word, in fact. And that word is caucasity. Oh, yeah. it really is. Yeah. He plays with a certain kind of pale skin, daring do. He, he's reclaiming the word from all the Karens and the aggressive ponytailed hippies out there. No longer, no longer will caucasity yeah. only refer to demanding to see the manager or wearing Tiva sandals in public. No, thanks to Christian Brown, will also include his magnific magnificent performance uh, off the bench today. Uh, Amin has Brown. been chasing around the jo the Jokic brothers. Uh, he's warning people don't make jokes at the expense of the Jokic brothers. Do you have anything to warn Brock Meyer yeah. about in the event that he uh, doesn't know that he needs to be careful around the Jokic brothers? So, Brock Meyer, I did a video in Denver about how I thought the Jokic brothers were a myth and there's something propaganda created by the Denver media to make Jokic seem a lot scarier than he really is. And then I saw them yesterday. And let me just tell you, the myths are true. The legends are true. It's like the Loch Ness Monster and the Yeti and the Abominable Snowman all rolled into one. The dude was breathing fire and tattoos on his body were moving as I saw them. Have you ever seen these creatures up close? No, I haven't. But even through the television, I'm with you. I would encourage Miami Heat fans in those lower sections down there to be very, very careful. Because it was all courtside adjacent. And at that price point, I'm assuming that Miami fans who, who got tickets were like shady mortgage brokers and 
<laughs> shady pharmaceutical executives or uh, maybe shady club owners, yeah. but just not the type of men who should be challenging two dead-eyed Serbian giants to a test of wills, okay? <laughs> the Rich Heat fans, these are balding men in tight shirts who employ goons. They yeah. <laughs> never put themselves in a position to throw hands with goons. Yeah. Jokic, what? They have two settings, those Jokic fellas, seething and rage. And... Uh, <laughs> I would hide before being on the receiving end of either of them. Can we get some predictions here? Because the Heat look like they're in trouble. They, uh, they, they I want to know what you think is going to happen the rest of the series here. I don't know. The only thing I'm sure of is that I will love it because I'm a, I'm a big fan of high-stakes basketball. These are the highest stakes possible because, as you know, Dan, I'm a big fan of your patented, the Dan Lebetard Heat culture is actually a cult theory. I think that's some of your finest words. That's not how that happened. Back. Brock Meyer, you, you put That's what you said. You said it. You put I it said. forward. I did not you put it point. forward. I I've given you said. credit for it. So based on past results, these finals go one of two ways. Yes, this is either the greatest victory in cult history, surpassing even when Scientology extorted the IRS into declaring it a religion so that they could attain tax-free status. Google that. It's true, kids. Or it goes the other way spectacular implosion that can be seen from a distance and lingers like a foul stench, like a Waco or a Jonestown. Dan, don't drink the Kool-Aid, please. Stick to the rivers and the lakes that how you would dress uh, is apparently what you're used to. Is that TLC? Uh, can you speak up, please? No, it's, uh, it's supposed to be a funny, like, little... Brock fight. Meyer, thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm running out of time this segment, but I'm not done with you because there are other things that I want to ask you about, including uh, the serious subject matter. Uh, I believe I have this right. Uh, one of the times you were on with us, it seemed like you were doing work for the Saudis, that uh, that you were contaminated and corrupt as well. I have that right, yes? Yeah, it didn't seem that way. It was that way. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right, so I want to ask you about what just uh, Liv just did, and hopefully we'll get to baseball at some point. Come back. Gee, did with Liv us. do something? I, I didn't hear. I'll have to look into it and get back to you. <laughs> Come back with us, would you? Sure. It's coming back to me now because I was embarrassed by it at the time. But he has a way of disarming me because he's charming and and drunk. But last time you were on with us or two or three times ago, it was clear, yes, that you had been bought by the uh, the Saudi wealth fund. And you're just now looking like a pioneer, Brock Meyer, mm -hmm. because uh, at the time I was judging you for it. But now the live PGA merger proves that you're just changing the game because you just got that money before other corrupt contaminated people did. As usual, I was one step ahead of everybody. I'm getting pretty lit up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sazerac. No, I took the, I, that's right. I took their money. Dan. I told you that a while ago. And you know what else? You're not going to get me to denigrate those great and honorable men over there. You know why I'm not going to do that, Dan? I don't. Because I like my limbs attached to my body. That's why. Okay. And not stacked like cordwood on the linoleum <laughs> bathroom floor of a courtyard by Marriott. All right. Lino okay? lino 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 linoleum. It's a tough word. I'm not drinking, but it is a tough word. <laughs> linoleum. I'm not trying to get you into any trouble, but can you give me any insight into why it is that you and PJ Commissioner Jay Monahan end up taking their the money for to sell their souls? Sure, because we're whores, Dan Levitard. How's that for insight? That is why we took the money. But what are we, alone? We're not alone. It's the age of whores, yeah? Where well, the only choice you ever get is what, what piece of yourself are you willing to sell? Whores American Life right now, it just feels like, you know what American Life feels like right now? That scene in Lord of the Rings where they're running away from that giant fire demon, the Balrog, I believe he was called, and, and their only escape is a bridge that's just collapsing beneath their feet. Mm -hmm. Only one Kazadum. way. Excuse me. The Bridge of Kazadum. Kazadum. Wow, even nerdier than I am. Amazing. <laughs> I thought I thought Balrog was a deep cut. Balrog of Morgoth, by the way. But wow, what kind of nerd? What is the nerd festival going on? Are you looking that up, or was that actually handy yeah. in your brain? Looking what up? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. What's it called? <laughs> All right, whatever she said, you're running along that thing. It's collapsing beneath your feet. And the only way to escape certain de doom, man, I'm lit up, is to leap <laughs> from rock to rock. The only you can only you have to make more money. That, that's the only way you can survive. We're all on OnlyFans in one way or another, except for Dan Levitar, except for you. 
I know you, Dan, are living a life without compromise because as a small child, you dreamed of having an empire funded by sports gambling being available <laughs> right in the palm of your hand. It's a dream fulfilled thanks to the wonderful people at DraftKings. That's but uh, uh, the rest of us, we're not so lucky. Some of us still have to hustle for a living. So, yeah. I sold my dignity and my big fat mouth for what now looks like a very small amount of money. Are you times, are uh, you saying the commissioner of the PGA prostituted himself? No, because if he had actually done that, I would respect it a lot more than what he did. Like if Jay Monahan decided to hang out in a rundown bathroom stall at an abandoned public park, giving out handies for crumpled up twenty dollar bills, that would be a lot more honorable than what he actually did. See, because to me, voluntarily tugging on somebody's pud, that's no different. That's, that's like pulling a lever in some factory. You're putting food on the table. You're trying to keep a roof over your head. Only difference is the hours in the bathroom stall are better than at the factory. But <laughs> Monahan, he's not struggling to get by. Now, is he? He's not some down on his luck, poorly dressed baseball broadcaster who will gladly pimp himself out to DraftKings now that Liv is going out of business. By the way, note to DraftKings, I am available. <laughs> no. Jay Monahan, very, very rich man already. Tens of millions of dollars in the bank. Set for life. Kids are set for life. Which means he didn't sell his entire soul for peace of mind or security. He sold it for a bigger yacht. Docked at a more expensive club. Gosh, a year ago, he stood in front of every microphone and camera that he could, and he planted a pedestal atop the highest horse to he wag did. his finger he at did. anybody who'd ever dare accept blood money. But he turns out to be the kind of twisted freak for whom the illusion of ethics, that was, that was a negotiating tactic to get the maximum amount of that same blood money pumped right into his veins. Absolutely despicable. And something I would have done in a second if they gave me half the chance, as would most people. <laughs> except, except for Dan, of course, we named him, and one other chosen golden man, just a Christ-like figure who has rejected <laughs> the hundreds of millions of dollars the Saudi Wealth Fund offered him so that he can accept slightly less money to live and play in Miami. I'm, of course, talking about... Mr. Lionel Messi, cheers to you guys. Oh, oh wow. You, you tricked me, Brock Meyer. Wow. What kind of shit is that? Switcheroo. What do you mean? What do you mean? It's August. This is the biggest news in the history of professional soccer in America. It should be celebrated, especially by Miami's own Dan Levitard. But I did find it. Did you hear him? I found it a little amusing the way Messi spoke about his desire to come and play in the MLS. He said he wanted to come to the United States, I'm quoting now, to live football in another way and enjoy the day-to-day -day more. <laughs> to live and play soccer in a calmer way, he said, which basically means, like so many others before him, he's moving to Florida, seeking an active retirement. <laughs> so, you know, I look forward to watching him be the best player in MLS history as he lets himself go and gets a pot belly and <laughs> grabs a tame. Yeah, that is the way to do it. It is. it is shocking to me. Now, that, one more thing about the Messi thing. Uh, it's sh the very idea that he would give up $600 million from the, the Saudis to move to Florida. Personally, I would not live in Florida if you paid me $600 million. Enough so with how... this, Brock Meyer. It's my home state. Come on. Knock it off. What are you doing? I, I'm sorry, Florida. Coasts are nice for parts of the year, I suppose. And I'm sure the, uh, the paved over swamps of central Florida have some good people in them who don't know any better, I guess. But it, it does not matter to me. If Shangri-La itself was located south of Tallahassee, I would still avoid it. Because you know why? I refuse to live in any place where I would ever be forced to see Ron DeSantis' face on my television more than I already do. My God. God. Honestly, have you ever seen such a vacuous, charmless void of a person? I, his laugh is just, it's, it, even his laugh is hideous. He just looks like a horse eating an apple, doesn't he? <laughs> teeth and strained neck and effort. Now, look at him. Oh. And now that he's running for president, oh, look at him. What's his first order of business? Running for president. First thing he does, takes Florida tax money to trick a group of asylum seekers in Texas. What's he doing bothering with folks over there so they can be flown in a private plane to Sacramento so they can be dropped off at a Catholic church as some kind of a prank? 
Yeah. Like he's like the Johnny Knoxville of human trafficking now, just tooth laughing <laughs> at the very idea of human empathy. <laughs> Gee, I guess, I guess, Dan, I guess it's the woke mind virus now to think that people should be treated as something other than livestock, huh? What a, just a, he's a, I want to clean this up for radio or whatever we're on, but he, he's, he's a, I'm going to choose my words carefully. He's a rancid little. <laughs> that's what he is. <laughs> <laughs> he went finger I, guns. I didn't notice yeah, that. You know, <laughs> you know. I'll, wait. You know, I this just came to me. <laughs> who he reminds me of? I, in all seriousness, do you remember the movie Weird Science? Remember that? Yes. <laughs> Extraordinarily problematic tale of two yes. horny teenagers who conjure up <laughs> Kelly LeBrock on their computers so they can have sex with her. It's a heartwarming story <laughs> and a hoodle. <laughs> that is what happened. The That's 80s. exactly what happened <laughs> in that Hoodles movie. Kills me. <laughs> <laughs> there was a bully in that movie named Chet. Remember him? Yeah. He gets turned. Yeah, he gets turned into this giant monster. That's true. That's Ron DeSantis. That's who he reminds me of, DeSantis. But actually, it, that doesn't hold up because Chet was played by uh, the legendary <laughs> Bill Paxton in one of his earliest roles. Really? Yeah. He was. Yeah. Oh, look that up. And he, even as a monster, Bill Paxton had more charm in humanity. <laughs> than DeSantis could ever convey in a thousand lifetimes. Plus, at the end of the film, Paxson as Chet expresses, you know, tangible regret for being so disgusting and repellent, which, of course, DeSantis would never, ever do. And old Ronnie boy, he's the unrepentant kind of monster, just <laughs> vomiting filth all around him and then blaming you for having the audacity to be bothered by the smell. Whoa. Uh -oh. Right. Wretched, uh, right. wretched. Yes. God, Florida. Here's to Florida. All right, enough, though. No politics with your sports. You're supposed to be doing a baseball segment for us. Don't we have, I don't think we have any imaging ready because we never do. Don't we have a strike four with Jim Brockmeyer segment that we're supposed to be doing here? It's a good name. Strike four. So our, th that's the name? Our, our baseball segment finally gets a name? I don't know. I don't name? know. I, some that's producer, what you guys came up with, huh? Be, it's supposed to be sold. We don't have sponsoring. I was hoping to get pills we don't have it oh you do have to that's pills? the music we don't have a library or catalog we can't afford real music so it's ragtime this is like the it's like the bar scene in the first star wars movie it's What's there. Going on over there? <laughs> 40 years before that a saloon most icely cantina with flappers pills pills was a light hitting uh, second baseman for the <laughs> for the Philadelphia Phillies back in the 40s. Um, and uh, what would you call it? Strike four? Yeah, Jim strike Brockmeyer? four with Jim Brockmeyer. Yeah, thanks, guy. I'm sure that, uh, boy, I'm sure your producers have given almost as much thought to that name as they did to their lunch order today. So thank you. <laughs> so bad. But yeah, I'm here, to, uh, I'm here to talk about the biggest story in baseball this week. We can, can we kill the music now? Because it's throwing me off. Like I'm about to, uh, Han shot first, by the way. Yes, he okay? did. Yeah, he did. Han shot first. All right. Biggest story in baseball this week, Oakland A's. In the running, this is true, for the worst baseball team in baseball history, which newsflash, folks, goes back a very, very long way. Uh, beginning of June, that's where we are. They've already been outscored by 200 runs. That is stultifying. They are 14 and 50, which means they are challenging not only just the expansion Mets record of 40 and 120 in 1962, but the Cleveland Spiders record of 20 and 134, <laughs> which comes all the way back from 1899. Nothing that happened in 1899 should ever be repeated in 2023. <laughs> now, that era was like all of the industrialism and all of the racism all at once. Let's not go back there. Now, why are the A's so bad, man? Because John Fisher, their owner, wants them to be bad. He figures that the worse they are, the easier it'll be to move the team to Las Vegas. But who's John Fisher? Who is he? He is the fail son of the two founders of the Gap Clothing Empire. Isn't yeah. capitalism fun? Yeah. Isn't it just great? We all bought jeans in the mall 30 years ago, and now <laughs> Oakland doesn't get to have a baseball team. Unless the stadium funding deal that they are seeking from Nevada is not assured of going through. Fisher might have made the A's so darn bad that nobody wants to pony up a billion dollars in tax dollars to get them. So maybe, maybe for once, somebody born on third doesn't get to fail their way across home plate. But, you know, as usual, I have my doubts about anything good ever happening again. So I'm not holding my breath. I'm just going to drink my yeah. Kahlua and coffee and Cesar. Yeah, your breath smells like liquor too early in the morning. Do you have anything to plug before you get out of here? 
Not really, but I do have a. <laughs> I do well apart from begging somebody to give me a job. Uh, now that I'm out of my my live golf job, but I I do have a call to action to your audience, if I might, Dan. I would just love it if people out there listening could take clips of Chet Monster from Weird Science, uh, take take clips of him talking, that guy talking, and play audio of Ron DeSantis being a weasley little dingleberry underneath it, and then tweet it at the show. Why I don't know. I just I think I would just find it amusing, and it's. It's better than actually having to look at his stupid face. All right, very <laughs> good, Brockmeyer. You can't talk like that on the podcast. We'll talk to you next just week. Just did, Dan Levitard, just did. <laughs> Sober up, please, sir. Thank you. Is it cold in the studio? Because the nerdy lady who was yelling out uh, Lord of the Rings stuff is all in a... Why is she in a blankie? But does she only feel safe in there with you, with you animals uh, wrapped up like that? I wouldn't blame her. It's so cold. Thank you.